Hello and welcome to the 2021 Taiwan Biotech Forum. I'm Dr. Xing Zhe Tu, the Chairman of Development Center for Biotechnology. Development Center for Biotechnology, DCB, is a non-profit organization in Taiwan. Our mission is to facilitate the development of Taiwan's biotech industry, especially international collaboration through business development and research development capabilities. Taiwan Biotech Forum has been held by DCB for more than 10 years and aimed to facilitate collaborations in academic, industry, and government globally. Although the world has been under the threat of COVID-19 more than one year, Taiwan has relatively fewer cases than the other neighboring countries from the beginning. I think this is the result of many joint collaborative efforts by our government, healthcare system, academic and research institute, as well as our biomedical sector. This is what I call fast and expert action. Collaborations beyond the borders became more crucial than ever, which is also the goal of both Taiwan Biotech Forum and also the Development Center for Biotechnology. 2021 Taiwan Biotech Forum themed preparing for the next pandemic, ready, set, and go gathering the leading minds in the fields of public health, AI, pharmaceuticals, therapeutics, and law from Taiwan and the world. The topics will look back on what we have learned from pandemic and also looking forward to revealing the enhancement needed for the future. I hope these seven excellent speeches not only bring you the professional thought and also inspire more ideas to find solutions to the diseases. Thank you again for joining us at the Taiwan Biotech Forum. I hope to meet you in person in the near future. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Chong Xin Wu, President of Development Center for Biotechnology. Welcome to 2021 Taiwan Biotech Forum. The COVID-19 outbreak has posed a major impact on the global economy and the society. Nevertheless, Development Center for Biotechnology is still in mission of being in the best partner of bioindustry. During the COVID-19 pandemic, DCB collaborated with Global Pharma and the biotech companies in drug development, and we also assisted government to establish research center for epidemic prevention science to expedite the application of academic technologies and also to promote the solutions for disease prevention in help of our global partners. Today, I'm very excited for the opportunity to exchange professional insights and to know the efforts Global made to avert the infectious disease crisis. We have gathered seven leading minds in the fields of public health, AI, pharmaceuticals, therapeutics, and the law from Taiwan and the world. They are as follows. Dr. Ching Cheng Chen, a professional in public health, will share about Taiwan's experience in keeping the pandemic under control and preparedness for future emerging infectious disease. Dr. Toru J. Sale from Pfizer will share about how to drive healthcare innovation in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. For AI, Dr. Qin Yong Lin will share the advanced AI technologies for drug development and genomic analysis. Fourth one, Dr. Philip Takari from Engine will share about therapeutics discovery 
and the future transformation of the biopharmaceutical industry. The fifth one, Mr. Sean Grady, Senior Vice President of Business Development Operations in AstraZeneca. We share about innovation and partnership in post-COVID era. The sixth one, Dr. Pin Yong Liu from National Chen Kong University Hospital. We share about a Taiwan-designed epidemic prevention unit, quarter unit for recovery emergency and ecology. The seventh one, Dr. Wen Chen Zhang from School of Law in Yangming Chao Tong University. We share about Taiwan's experience of human rights-centered approach for pandemic control. Thank you again for participating in the 2021 Taiwan Biotech Forum. Last but not the least, I believe through the effort we made, we can meet face to face soon and we'll be better than ever. Welcome, Welcome to 2021 Taiwan Biotech Forum. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is really my pleasure and honor to be invited to give a talk on 2021 Taiwan Biotech Forum. Today, I'm going to talk about Taiwan's experience and preparation for future emerging infectious disease. According to Taiwan CDC's statistics, uh, in the whole world, uh, there were 168 million confirmed cases and over 3.8 million deaths, given a case mortality rate of 2.1%. The United States is the most severely affected country with more than 33 million confirmed cases, more than 600,000 deaths, given a case fatality rate of 1.8%. In Taiwan, with a population of 23 million, there were more than 6,000 confirmed cases and 46 days, given a case fatality rate of 0.8%. And around 80% of the confirmed cases in Taiwan were locally transmitted cases, and 18% were imported cases. After the SARS outbreak in year 2003, Taiwan started to reform the epidemic prevention system. We amended our Communicable Disease Control Act and the relevance and regulation. We also restructured the organization and mission of Ministry of Health and Taiwan CDC. We authorized Taiwan CDC uh, to designate healthcare institution to function as the responding or isolation hospitals. We also enhanced hospital infection control through accreditation. And we standardized the procedures for communicable disease surveillance and reporting domestically and internationally. We also optimized our border quarantine procedures and recruited and trained infectious disease specialists in Taiwan CDC. And the last but not the least is to establish our National Health Command Center. For the COVID-19 containment, uh, we have five important elements. That's the prudent action, rapid response, early deployment, transparency, as well as public trust and solidarity. We did not lock on any city. We did not do a mass testing, but we used a smart technology to have a rapid and precise responses to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. For the prudent surveillance of pandemic status, we used ICT and AI technology to help us. We also used cellular broadcast to uh, rapidly and widely announce of the uh, travel warning. And we have uh, used uh, e-quarantine system to strengthen our border control. And for the in-depth tracing of cross country of confirmed cases, we use the ICD and big data analysis to do uh, this kind of uh, uh, very precise contact tracing. And we also use the digital fencing tracking and line board system to uh, implement our 
are mandatory home isolation and quarantines of close contact or inbound passengers. Uh, we carry out uh, precise uh, testing for the notified suspect with symptoms inside. We also mobilized the healthcare system for isolation treatment uh, using uh, big data monitoring and more than uh, 20,000 isolation rooms and 14,000 ventilators were mobilized. And we also uh, used this uh, disinfection robot to enhance hospital infection control. In Taiwan, uh, we home quarantine or home isolation for the inbound passengers as well as the close contact. The inbound passengers uh, have to be home quarantined for 14 days and close contact with confirmed cases have to be isolated at home for 14 days. And we use electronic security monitoring system to track the location and health status of people. They are subjected to home quarantine at all home isolation. And on this slide, you can see the APP for the quarantine system for entry, as well as this uh, uh, reporting system. And we use the home quarantine tracking system to know the health status of every isolated or quarantined people. And we use line bar system uh, for the uh, disease containment uh, experts and try to do this uh, very good health follow-up of this uh, quarantine or isolated people. And in order uh, to let this uh, uh, quarantine or isolated people to stay in this uh, quarantine place, we use the digital fencing tracking system to help us to do this uh, tracing and try to urge all this uh, isolated or quarantined people to stay at this uh, quarantine place. And Taiwan AI Labs also developed uh, several platforms to help us to contain the COVID-19. This includes this uh, social distancing APP, which can inform uh, the person uh, might have been infected nearby you. And we also have the health reported APP. You, we, we use uh, natural language processing and also the uh, facial recognition to help us to implement our digital fencing system. And for the checkers rate of this uh, confirmed cases, we have this uh, AI-based SARS-CoV-2 classifier uh, to differentiate the patient well, the COVID-19 infection or not. And we also use this uh, AI uh, system to help us to trace this uh, virus strain. And AI uh, platform was also developed for the drug repurposing and drug screening. And for the uh, COVID-19 literature review, we have another uh, AI-based uh, platform. Uh, according to the report, of U.S. Uh, National Bureau of Economic Research uh, published in October 2020. Uh, they compare uh, the uh, COVID-19 mortality per million people on this uh, horizontal axis and this uh, GDP loss uh, on this uh, uh, vertical axis. And as you can see, among the 40 countries compared, and Taiwan is the country uh, with the lowest uh, mortality uh, from COVID-19 and is the only country with the negative GDP loss. In other words, uh, in Taiwan, we have positive economic growth uh, in 2020. So in October 2020, Taiwan has a very good uh, containment of COVID-19 and also have very good uh, economic growth. And as we all know that COVID-19 has accelerated the development and manufacture of medical products for pandemic contaminant. And recognizing the gravity of the public health emergency and the importance of facilitating availability of the many uh, pharmaceuticals, regulatory agents in many countries allow the use of approved medical products or um, approved use of approved medical products for COVID-19 management. When statutory criteria have made, 
this including that there were no adequate, approved, and available alternatives. Biomedical industry in many countries have developed effective vaccines and therapeutics to prevent and treat COVID-19 since it became a pandemic in January 2020. There are several platforms for the COVID-19 vaccine development, and it is a consensus among experts that only effective and safe COVID-19 vaccine will end the pandemic. And the pandemic has facilitated the development of vaccine platform distinct from the classical uh, vaccines. This next generation platforms include viral factor vaccine, nuclear acid-based vaccine, and antigen-presenting cells. And many vaccines derived from the next generation platform have been approved by the World Health Organization. And these are this slide shows the conceptual diagram showing the three uh, vaccine types for forming SARS-CoV-2 protein. The first one is this RNA vaccine, and the second is the subunit vaccine, and the third is the viral vector vaccine. So due to this uh, intensive R&D as well as accelerated production of the vaccine, and by uh, December uh, 2020, many countries already started the immunization program in their country. And Israel is a good example. Israel implemented national uh, immunization program on the 19th of uh, December 2020. And as you can see on these slides, uh, more than uh, 10 million doses has been uh, given to uh, the people in Israel and covered around 63% with one dose and 59% with two doses. Uh, along with the increase in this uh, proportion of uh, people uh, received this uh, vaccine, and you can see a very rapid uh, decline in the um, COVID-19 instance on the top panel, as well as the decreased mortality uh, on the lower panel. And this is also true for the UK. And UK started the immunization program on the 8th of December last year. And also uh, by the early May, uh, more than uh, 53 million doses have been given to uh, people in the UK, with 50% uh, of the people receive one dose and 26% receive two doses. And Along with this uh, expanded immunization program in the UK, as you can see, the instance rate and mortality rate of COVID-19 also declined after January uh, 2021. And now uh, the disease is under very well control in the UK. In the United States, uh, even in this uh, uh, January of this year, they have very uh, significant uh, outbreak of this uh, COVID-19 in the United States. And however, along with this uh, uh, expanded immunization program in the United States, by uh, early May, that uh, more than uh, 259 million doses were given to uh, people in the United States and showing a coverage rate of one dose for 45% of the people and two doses for 34% of the people. And on this slide, you can also see that there's a rapid decline in both instance and mortality of COVID-19 in the United States after the immunization program uh, was implemented. So vaccination indeed is the one of the best uh, way to contain COVID-19. However, in Chile, uh, we observed a very a peculiar uh, phenomenon and as you can see that uh, they implemented this immunization program in early January uh, of 2021, and more than 12 million doses of Sinopharm vaccine have been given to people in Chile uh, with a coverage of one dose is uh, 38% and two dose coverage of 24%. But the both both uh, instance rate and mortality rate uh, did not decline 
as expected. And according to Bloomberg's COVID resilience score, Taiwan uh, was uh, ranked as the number three in December, in November 2020. In other words, uh, Taiwan has good uh, resilience at that time and only after New Zealand and Japan. However, we did not get a good access to the COVID-19. So in December 2020, uh, we remained good, but um, on in the January 2021, Taiwan was ranked as the number four. The reason for that is uh, we have uh, a poor access to COVID vaccine and also the doses given per 100 people uh, in Taiwan was also uh, quite low. And in April 2021, uh, the Taiwan was ranked under the number uh, five, it's even uh, lower. And uh, this due to this uh, poor uh, vaccination coverage. And in May, Taiwan uh, had a large scale outbreak of uh, COVID-19 uh, due to this uh, infection of British variant B117. And the outbreak started from this uh, the uh, male uh, adult uh, entertainment venues and so-called tea houses. And at that time, uh, we did not uh, contain this uh, community transmission uh, very well. So this uh, Taiwan uh, COVID resilience score was ranked as a, the number uh, 15. So we have to try our best to contain this uh, COVID-19 outbreak in Taipei City and New Taipei City, and also, more importantly, to uh, accelerate the immunization program in Taiwan. And as you can see here, uh, from the November 2000 to May 2021, um, uh, many countries, especially in Asia, the uh, COVID resilience has been uh, declined. The reason for that is uh, we have a poor uh, immunization program in these uh, countries, including the uh, Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, Malaysia, and India. For the post COVID 19 strategies of economic development in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan proposed a very important program called Big Health uh, Program, and this including uh, six uh, aspects. The first one is the epidemic prevention technology, followed by e-health, precision medicine, health promotion services, smart healthcare, smart hospital, as well as healthcare regulatory sandbags. And we all know that uh, artificial intelligence has been applied to healthcare uh, very uh, prominently in a recent decade. Uh, it, AI was used to uh, facilitate this efficient uh, diagnosis and the reduced error and also uh, can be used for uh, robot assisted surgery and develop uh, the new medicine and uh, mining or managing uh, medical data and can streaming, streamlining uh, patient uh, experience. And in Taiwan, a lot of ICT industry are involved in the healthcare and the, for the precision healthcare industry in Taiwan, this including the mobile healthcare and medical equipment, a smart hospital solution, and gene and cell therapy, as well as uh, biomedical uh, key components. And we have focused on the technology of IoT, 5G, AI, VR, AR, and uh, cloud computing, as well as blockchain. So we hope that through this kind of effort, we may facilitate our uh, preparedness for the COVID-19 uh, containment for the time being, and also for the future uh, outbreak of the emerging infectious diseases. For the new technology of the uh, strategic epidemic prevention, we consider that we have to develop so-called zero-touch economy as well as zero distance innovation for the diagnosis and therapy of the emerging infectious disease is very important. We have to uh, develop test kits, rapid 
test uh, antiviral vaccine and new therapies. As soon as possible, we identify the pathological agent. And for the disinfection, for the healthcare and telemedicine, there's also a lot of different aspects that we can engage in to promote this uh, epidemic prevention uh, in the future. And in addition to this healthcare aspect, for the uh, prevention of this um, future epidemic of emerging infectious diseases, we have also used different kinds of uh, technology to apply it to the environmental health, including this and uh, uh, a robot uh, disinfection and visualize the epidemic prediction and so forth. And we have to develop a smart city with a smart surveillance system. And then we can have online citizenship uh, services and so forth. And for the manufacturing industry, the real-time supply chain monitoring and uh, telematic and fleet management are also very important. And for the, even for the individual need, the uh, streaming media, telecommuting, online learning, and so forth are very important. For the uh, future uh, emerging infectious disease uh, control, I think that uh, we have to implement the uh, precision containment. And this including the identification of infectious agent as precisely and as early as possible. And we have to share outbreak data and biospecimen transparently with other countries. And border control and traveling warning has to be implemented uh, very accurately and on time. And intensive R&D of diagnostic antiviral and vaccine are also important. And we definitely have to use this AI and ICT system to implement a mandatory reporting of confirmed cases timely and have a very careful uh, tracking and tracing of the cross contact. Uh, with regard to the testing of this uh, cross contact and suspects of the infection, uh, we need to uh, use this uh, very precise uh, diagnostics. And for the stringent isolation of cross contact, we it's very important and we can use the ICT and AI technology to help us to monitor the, the performance of the quarantine the people. And furthermore, a promotion of personal hygiene, social distancing, and avoidance of large-scale gathering, they are also important for the future uh, containment of emerging infectious diseases. Uh, last but not least, I would like to emphasize the importance of the global solidarity and the international collaboration in the containment of the future pandemics. Infectious diseases respect no border. Any pandemic or emerging infectious disease is detrimental to global health, economic development, social stability, national security, and regional peace. So no country can fight the pandemic alone. Transparency and honesty are the best policy. I think that uh, we should not have any health nationalism and no uh, deglobalization. We have to help each other through international cooperation, and it is the key for the successful containment of future pandemic of emerging infectious disease. With that, I would like to conclude my talk, and thank you very much for your listening. Good morning. My name is Tor J. Sale from Pfizer. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer of Taiwan Biotech Forum. It is really a pleasure and delighted to be here. Despite all the challenges that we have been going through for more than a year, and with a substantial casualty globally, we are witnessing unprecedented events that I thought we'll never see in my time. One of which, of course, is the miracles we see in vaccine development, which I will cover later. But we also see many changes that can be a norm in the years to come as we witness the transformation in life sciences. Before I go into details, let me have your attention on this slide that my presentation is forward-looking statement. 
Let me recapitulate what I think to expect in this time of pandemic. As many of you are familiar with this already, before COVID-19, the innovation in drug discovery with new technology and science captured everyone in this field. Nevertheless, there's a heightened efforts to further drive innovation. And I will give some example on this, focusing on oncolytic virus and of course, mRNA drug discovery. Similarly, digital technology has been very hot topic in life sciences, but COVID-19 pandemic accelerates this transformation as more automation, flexibility of utilization, awareness of monitoring of health at the individual levels have increased. The partnering and collaboration in the name of open innovation is not new, but companies are more inclined to engage in the partnering as agility of development as well as acquiring new technology become compulsory to be competitive. One obvious example is our partnership with the BioNTech, which helped us, which helped us to accelerate mRNA vaccine development. And this is also true with many other companies. Outside of basic science, it is worth mentioning about the virtual clinical trial and hospital cares. Pfizer led the virtual clinical trials a few years ago, but in this pandemic where hospitalization is no longer a commodity that people can take it for granted, pharma is more opt for virtual clinical trials where patients do not need to go to the hospital. In keeping with this, there is a, a trend for remote healthcare in some instances where patients do not have to rely on going hospital to continue therapy and or maintain their health. Logistics of drug distributions and affordable health cares are also important and became very apparent in our experience facing COVID-19. I will not cover everything in my talk and will focus on the first innovation in drug discovery, and perhaps a little bit on the digital technology. Some of you may have seen this slide. We have approximately 20,000 genomes of which druggable is consider considered to be about 5,000. And there are three to 500 disease modifying genes. So in order to develop innovative disease-modifying therapy, only 1,000 or so are considered to be tangible drug targets with the existing technology. However, with the recent advances in new modality, both in biologics as well as small molecule spaces represented in the bottom box, we can now access previously undruggable targets, and these are expected to increase our drug target spaces by two to three fold. I covered some of these in the past, and today I would like to expand on gene therapy, oncolytic virus, and mRNA therapy. Before I move to each modality, let me introduce you to the strategy of Pfizer. Pfizer is interested in the diverse therapeutic areas as shown in this slide, where we think we have expertise to lead these, to lead these spaces. One strategy is to identify mode of actions to explore underlying mechanisms that span multiple disease etiology and pathogenesis as shown in the red box. Let me elaborate a bit more. These are some examples of cellular and molecular changes leading to pathogenesis of certain diseases. We know that the DNA repeat expansion 
is known for certain devastating diseases, particularly neuromuscular and CNS, CNS diseases. But it is becoming more apparent that similar phenomena occur in other diseases as well. Also, the senescence. In other words, aging at the cellular and molecular levels is suspected to cause a plethora of diseases. And if we can modulate the senescence or its regulatory machinery, we believe it will provide a new class of therapy in multiple disease areas. Similarly, DNA damage is well known for cancer onsets, but we now know that the more and more diseases are triggered, either in full or partially, by this anomaly. Taken together, we believe that this approach will become more common and will be the area of investment in the industry. So let me shift the gear to oncolytic virus. Since FDA approval of TVAC in 2015, many farmers and biotechs are interested in oncolytic virus as the next generation of cancer therapy, especially those who do not respond to chemo or immunotherapy. By the way, TVEC actually stands for a very complex, tongue-twisting uh, name uh, that I will not even bother to pronounce. So if you are interested, please do, uh, please do the Google search on TVEC, T slash V-E-C. This slide from Zen shows a landscape of oncolytic virus research and development. There are many types of viruses being explored but adeno, herpes, and vaccinia are the predominant virus. 60% of the current development is aimed for combination therapy with a chem a chemo or immunocheckpoint inhibitors. In fact, one noteworthy data of combination therapy Mark has shown is that oncolytic virus with a PD-1 or CTLA-4 showed a substantial improvement in overall response rate is overall response rate in stage three and four melanoma patients, which is very exciting as we may have a tool to treat patients who did not respond to the current therapy otherwise. With that being said, most oncolytic virus development is in early phase due to many challenges that needs to be resolved. This may be obvious to you, but let me quickly go through how oncolytic virus works. Genetically modified virus that has specific genes for cancer cells is delivered to the cells and this gene or genes uh, allow selective entry to cancer cells, but not to the normal cells. Bio virus will then replicate in cancer cells and ultimately kill the cells by lysis and shed new virus to infect the other cancer cells. Unfortunately, the effect of oncolytic virus thus far is not the robust for solid tumors due to many challenges such as delivery and gene transduction. There is also a concern on safety on its use. This slide illustrates some challenges in oncolytic virus. First, most oncolytic virus is intratumor injection. So systemic distribution is needed to expand its capability to metastatic cells and also chemo-resistant cancer cells. Systemic administration will also maximize the secondary anti-tumor immunity. Moving to intratumor to systemic administration poses its own challenges that include the host immune responses, such as cytokine storm, and also viral replication in normal cells, which we definitely would not want to have. 
So here's the one of the ongoing effort to mitigate these changes. Yokavio came up with the oncolytic virus that is coated with human membranes to evade host immune responses. Also, the virus and or gene itself has a kill switch built in. The combination of these two allow not only systemic administration, which can also target metastatic cancers and, and stimulate the secondary anti-tumor immunity. It also enables the control of a viral replication or, G, or gene transduction with the kill switch. In the case, in this case, use the light of a specific wavelength. This is one example, but there are many new ideas and it will be very interesting to see how this field advances. The gene therapy has come a long way to the point that it can be viewed as transformative therapy. Although most gene therapy is currently focused on monogenic diseases, it is expected to expand into disease areas where conventional drugs or therapy pose challenges or simply is not effective, such as a CNS and cardiovascular space. However, in a current gene therapy, we do not have a way to control gene transduction once gene is introduced to the cell or tissues of interest. You can easily envision that this fact indeed limit the utilizations of gene therapy to more common diseases for the safety concern. One interesting technology is to introduce the on-off switch that is similar to the oncolytic virus I mentioned earlier. As shown in this slide, where the blue lights, in this case, allow the control of uh, control editing using the CRISPR-Cas9. I understand that this technology is also applicable for other gene editing tools, such as Cas12 and Crelox system. Here's an example of on-off switch using iPS cells. A plasmid encoding a transcription factor, neurogenic differentiation one, is activated by the light leading to differentiation into neurons. There are several technology for on-off switch in gene editing. However, a hallmark of this technology is that it is not the one-time activation deactivation, but can be repeated as long as the gene of interest remains in cells or tissues. So MeGenes, who developed this technology, is currently working on hearing loss, where they activate the hair cells in cochlea to recover hearing. The technology is also being applied to some CNS target. Their idea is to control gene transduction to avoid tachyphylaxis and cell death associated with excess gene expression. Now, let me move into vaccine. While I would love to discuss Pfizer's vaccine per se, I will not be able to talk specifics due to the fact that the many things are still ongoing. And therefore, my discussion here is general, but hope it is of interest to the audience. I cannot emphasize enough that we have witnessed the miracle of COVID-19 vaccine, which were developed and administered to people within two years. This was made possible only because of collaborative and selfless efforts of scientists in all sectors and regulatory and healthcare professionals. This slide illustrates how significant it is. As you can see, 
all vaccines development in the past usually takes decades for the development. Here's more details. It was late 2019 that MD Anderson, Scripps, and Chinese Institute, including the Wuhan Institute, worked diligently to decode the viral genome, which were made public in January of 2020. And as you know, the first vaccine was approved in October. Some were alleged made earlier in Russia, although I do not have enough information to give you more details. Then here we are. Still lots of challenges, but many people have already been vaccinated, and we see the lights that COVID-19 may no longer be a threat to our society. So putting the philosophy aside, how does it work? This vaccine is very different from the conventional vaccine where live or attenuated virus is injected as a mean of immunization. Instead, patient is given mRNA encoding for a specific gene, spike protein for the COVID-19 in this case, in a nanoparticle which is then translated within the cells to be expressed by cells. Together with the help of T and antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, can promote the antibody production via B cells, which ultimately eradicate the virus itself or infected cells via antibody dependent cytotoxicity. But perhaps more importantly, antigen presenting cells also prime the subsets of T cells to be activated, such as killer T cells, which in turn obliterate infected cells. Due to its very close relationship to immunology, many companies pivoted to focus on COVID-19. As you can see in this slide, there are 37 in phase one, 27 in phase two, and 20 development or candidates in phase three. And may I remind you that the genome became available only about a year ago. And we expect this to continue, especially for the therapeutics after vaccine becomes readily available. So what is next? And where does it lead to? If you look at the expected effects of the mRNA vaccine, especially those highlighted in red, selective eliminations of cells is possible via macrophages and natural killers uh, of natural killer cells, via antibody and T cell dependent cytotoxicity. Selective elimination of cells, of course, is crucial for many cancers or cancer therapies. And as such, in addition to its applicability to other infectious diseases, its robust immunomodulatory endpoints enables cancer treatment and possibly cancer resistance via vaccination. I am not that naive to take this for granted and realize that there's still many challenges ahead. But I hope to see this with uh, efforts by the leaders in the audience and others in all sectors. For the last two slides, let me summarize where the digital health is leading to as digital health and digital transformation, transformation is also accelerated in this COVID-19 pandemic era. For us in the life science industry, our goal is to really understand the disease and how to best treat the patients. And digital therapeutics or anything digital is becoming more and more important tools to take advantage of. And here are some of the examples. First, the big data. 
deploying the big data and machine learning to create accurate disease models and also that it also to predict the diseases are extremely important and then we have ability to continuously monitor the patient's endpoints. This can be done by uh, I, um, uh, uh, IoT and ICT, or any wearable devices that are becoming so common these days. Utilization of technology alone, or in combination with the pharmaceutical agents as a digital therapeutics has gained substantial uh, tractions um, in, in everywhere. And the regulatory agencies have approved a series of digital therapeutics in this space. Implementing quantitative measure of a clinical efficacy is another component that the digital health can really contribute. And lastly, but not least, tracking each patient's biomarker diagnostic to enable the personal treatment option is becoming a important component, especially in the place of personalized and precision medicine. And this includes the liquid biopsy to identify a specific ge uh, genetic makeup to develop the cancer or for those patients who are predisposed to a, a certain type of cancers. With all these technologies and innovations in drug discovery and the digital health, we believe that these are going to contribute more and more, and then we are hopeful that we should be, we can provide better and more robust treatment to those patients who need our help. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, good evening everyone. It's my pleasure here to uh, talk about our work in AI tools for medicine. My name is uh, Qin Yonglin, I'm the CEO of Graven Inc. and also a John professor in Columbia University. Uh, Graven is a uh, a start company that uh, we focus on building the uh, AI platform and then try to uh, apply that in several different domains, especially in the finance and the medical domains. So we are, uh, our headquarters is in New York and all the branches in several places in the world. And uh, the Grapen's call is about RD for brand AI platform. So this platform try to uh, using the graph computing because that uh, human brain is actually a huge graph. And they use graph computing to build a unique AI platform that can simulate uh, the whole brain functions. So for example, about like uh, uh, the cause uh, of proprietary graph database, and then uh, using that to do analysis, uh, have a sense about video understanding, language understanding, and then uh, machine learning, deep learning, autonomous learning tools. And uh, the key part is about how we can develop the advanced uh, part like a human brain about uh, explanation. When you detect something, you can explain why it's like that. And also about the reading to understand that if something happened, what will the other things will happen? And what will be the things behind that? And about the strategy, that is how you can uh, create a way to solve the problems. And uh, uh, we have this kind of uh, pipeline that to put all the components together. So uh, to build that, we are able to build a lot of applications, especially for example, here in the medical domain. Uh, in May 2020, there was a, a company that published a white paper actually mentioned that uh, like uh, Google's DeepMind or like a uh, Graven's tools and also like uh, NVIDIA and the Intel will potentially help accelerate the speed of drug discovery, development, testing. Uh, so uh, we are actually happy to see that uh, our name is uh, shown together with uh, Google, NVIDIA and uh, Intel these big companies. So hopefully that uh, our work can be really contributed that big. So uh, here is an introduction about what are the key tools that we've been building. So the Graphen AI tools for medicine, uh, we call it as an item. So there are several different things. For example, it's a consumer whole genome disease analysis, or uh, personalized precision medicine part. So these are for the consumer uh, services. 
And we have a lot of tools for the drug development. And so these are actually co-development with the pharmaceutical companies. And also our research components, including for example, the late, uh, the recent COVID-19 uh, virus surveillance, and also like uh, the large scale AI medical article understanding work. So uh, today that uh, I will talk in the order of the from research to the uh, drug development to the consumer service part. So on the research part of course, I will talk about the virus uh, monitoring surveillance works. So uh, since uh, early last year, we have been keep like uh, getting data from NSAID about uh, all the uh, sequence the uh, uh, COVID-19 mut uh, mutations. And then we have been uh, finding like uh, how one virus mutated to another one, and then building up the whole graph about how the uh, evolution works. And uh, then uh, very beginning, you know, it was like, uh, yeah, like uh, uh, December 24th, I think it was the first time that uh, the, uh, the virus is what captured and the sequence. And then, and in fact, at that time, there was already like three to five variants uh, for the original one, initial ones. So based on the later mutation that we actually can kind of go back to understand, it was kind of the originally started from maybe November uh, last year. And uh, so far we have been like monitoring more than 1.4 million sequences trends since the beginning of the outbreak. And uh, just some example about how initial visualization is. So uh, we have the work like, uh, so the green one is actually a strain. And uh, then uh, the red dot is actually the samples on the strain. So from here, we actually can see that they actually, like uh, for example, in the middle for this strain, and uh, it kind of has uh, some mutated one into each strain. And then each strain, then you can see the each samples on that. So, for this way, we actually are able to build up, <coughs> sorry, this type of the uh, relationship of the, all these uh, viruses. And uh, <coughs> initially, you can clearly see there are two clusters of them. And these two clusters, and then it kind of gradually evolved to several clusters in the world, and they actually keep evolving, keep evolving. Uh, so uh, after we keep building that we are able to kind of monitor all these kind of variances in the world and especially from uh, the country level, uh, province level, state level to the city level, how those are being changed. And then also it's mutations, how one change to another one. So for example, uh, for this uh, early monitoring system, we like in the previous uh, talk uh, in the end of the September, I actually have kind of saw the this uh, uh, so-called later so-called uh, the UK variants that are upcoming, and actually about uh, started warning that because that I we saw that there are some kind of things that are kind of the can make it uh, strong in terms of the the transmission to others. So uh, our team has been working on the way about like uh, how you can really to model the mutations of each, uh, each, each virus. And then how you can predict how this mutation can actually impact your function. So we actually model that in terms of the very details about how potentially this one can work with uh, like uh, uh, its function and also how its mutation can work in terms of the, how it interact with uh, different uh, antigens, and then uh, also also the, the antibodies, how you can interact with that. So uh, we can check that, and then to to get the, this kind of prediction about how effective this uh, this mutation can be. So here we show an example, especially on the viral entry and the immune escape issues. And uh, you can see that we actually combine different kinds of the, uh, forces about consider about the protein side chain mutation prediction, and also consider about the critical force fields for biological or macromolecules at the atom level, and combine all these forces together, try to kind of have a good prediction about how one, um, one change and how it can impact 
the functions. So here is just a, a kind of comparison about the algorithms, about when we try to find in this kind of the binding energy prediction model. And uh, so far we, we compare with uh, uh, many other uh, non-models. And we do find out that we actually has been doing a relatively good job that I can outperform other tools about how you can predict the, the forces, the, the binding forces. And uh, so uh, with this tool, we actually are able to see, for example, a key variation of uh, the variant on N5O1Y. You actually increase the binding ability to ACE2. So for example, we can see that uh, the binding energy was uh, 1.64 when the uh, N5, one or Y that the increase uh, happened. And uh, another key thing we actually found uh, uh, lately about uh, how and the why the UK variant has been quite kind of significantly uh, capable. Uh, a key thing is actually, it, it actually has uh, another mutation that is in this uh, HR1 area. So HR1 area is uh, the area that uh, it actually help to cut the the the, uh, the regions in in the virus, and then to help it to be able to better uh, the memory fusion to enter the the cells. So the the kind of the uh, total energy change has been quite significant. So it becomes that uh, as you can see here in the in the UK virus that uh, this. Uh, Particular mutations in the H HR1 actually helps a lot in terms of how you can really enter the cell. And uh, so this makes it become quite kind of the, uh, capable in terms of the uh, doing tra uh, transmission. So that's why that, uh, for example, right now, United States has been more than like 72% is in this UK virus. And uh, we actually also see the powerful part on the uh, G or the P1 virus here can also contribute to the uh, viral entry. And uh, uh, another example we actually are able to see is that uh, the uh, South African variants. So for this variant uh, that uh, the binding strength we have been seeing, it actually is a kind of the, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from the virus and the to, uh, to the entire body, it actually kind of the decrease about uh, 51%. So it make that uh, 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 we saw that a lot of the previous work also show some kind of the machines that have become less effective if we deal with uh, South Africa, this variant. As you can see from the number here, it actually show a lot of the things that are the one to reduce neutralization way there, okay. And uh, we also see that, uh, for example, the UK variant actually is not the, much in terms of uh, comparably to others in terms of the, its impact on the uh, immune on the antibodies. So that's why that uh, maybe that's why so far the UK uh, variance has not been like uh, uh, showing some difficulty for, for, the, uh, for the machines. And uh, here we also see like uh, for example, the India variance is also kind of the, uh, has a strong capability in terms of the escape the uh, the antibodies. So we actually test that uh, test this model with a 145 spike antibody compresses and uh, to have this kind of the the uh, the find find the, the average changes on that. So we also, we saw that it can be a good explanation about how you can like uh, uh, detect and then predict uh, the how the mutant calls the uh, calls the machines. So uh, we also developed uh, tools that uh, try to uh, predict the efficacy and including the epitope sequence prediction from the antigen and the set of VDJ recombined sequence prediction and the using structure by the uh, protein generator and, uh, to be able to pro predict the antibody from machine or antigen. So these are the, uh, the work that uh, we have been working on in terms of the, the virus duration. And uh, uh, from this type of the uh, foundation, about a lot of details we work on, we actually uh, have been working on these uh, uh, tools for the drug development. 
And in terms of drug development, it has been uh, applicable for many different applications. And uh, in order to solve these issues, we actually develop uh, several tools for that. Uh, starting from how we can find our drugable candidates, uh, how we can do that from the well-known candidates, and then have a candidate pre-processing uh, to the small molecular biosimilar drug development, and then to the uh, precision drug development. So uh, the first two tools that are like uh, the whole genome uh, analysis tool that we will explain uh, more detail later, and then about the single pathway analysis tool. So you try to find uh, the most important candidates from patients with genes and genomics uh, phenotypes, and then uh, try to find in our potential druggable protein, druggable or uh, gene finding. And uh, about a lot of the uh, tools help to find in our the candidates. So including that uh, protein structure prediction tool, uh, epitol or uh, pedotol type prediction tool, uh, protein function prediction tool, and the protein or uh, binding site prediction tool. So among uh, inside the tool, we actually has a lot of the uh, functionality that are especially, uh, it was built on the uh, deep learning tools and uh, including like uh, the uh, graph neural network tools. That's been the most common one that we have been used. And then based on that, we actually can achieve uh, many different kind of tools, how we do that. Now, because of the time uh, in this talk, we could not go to detail for each tool. But uh, yeah, I hope in the future we can uh, discuss that in, in more detail. And uh, uh, also, then the next step is about this uh, small molecular biosimilar drug development. And uh, for that, uh, for uh, small molecular drug development on the simulation side and the purpose side, and uh, we have this uh, uh, game model drug target affinity prediction tool. Uh, ADME prediction tools. And uh, then uh, we are actually still working on the reaction chain databases like uh, uh, drug synthesis reaction chain uh, simulations. And uh, on the biosimilar side, that we are working on this uh, uh, peptide GAN tool, and uh, then to have an uh, antibody antigen uh, contact prediction tool, and the uh, affinity prediction tool, and etc. So uh, for these tools that uh, here in, in, the, in the pipeline, we are able to uh, potentially help a lot and speed up the drug development and also to uh, predict these functions. And uh, then uh, the last stage is about uh, after you have that and how you can potentially to help out with a uh, precision drug development. And uh, that is like uh, how you compute in the drug mechanism, how your, your mutant binding energy prediction and the central. So uh, to summarize the function of the, uh, these uh, uh, drug development tools, that uh, we can see that uh, uh, so far our tools, uh, we, we are not as competitive on the protein structure prediction tool because I think that you probably, uh, people are familiar with this uh, alpha fold that uh, Google put a lot of effort on that. And uh, we are catching up um, in the area. And then uh, for others, we are kind of quite competitive about how we can do this uh, parallel type site prediction, epitope site prediction, protein function prediction, drug target interaction, uh, ADME prediction, drug binding affinity prediction tool. So we, we are kind of uh, yeah, confident that uh, our tools can start to help in, in the uh, real practices. So uh, here are uh, a list of that. And then uh, you actually can see the most of the tools that will be finished. And then right now we are in the process that are working with uh, partners to, to see how these tools can really help them in, uh, in their drug development process. Okay. So uh, in the last area that uh, we have been working on is how we can use these AI tools to do really uh, help the consumers. So to help consumers, that uh, the key part is that, that uh, whether we can help them to understand the why am I, and uh, especially, yeah, why am I, what made me genetically, how am I doing today, how can it happen in the future? It's about how you can potentially help people to really digitize this person and uh, to understand the like, uh, overall view on 
on what he, he is originally is today and the, how can go from the password viewpoint. So uh, we force uh, that uh, we built up this uh, uh, whole genome uh, analysis system that uh, try to gather all kinds of the data as potentially possible and then try to identify what the diseases that are currently really can, can kind of have a good prediction um, uh, based on the whole genome data for each person. And then also about the academic insights about how we can do the test mining and then to kind of summarize each paper and create a Q and A low part based on each paper. So we are able to all this kind of uh, large scale AI medical mining. And then in other words, it's like uh, try to use artificial intelligence to check the collective intelligence through like a citation network. So because that uh, in the in the in the medical domain, actually in the, any domain, is like uh, for the paper publication. If a paper is a kind of cite more, or if you some more the well cited paper cite you, you actually indicate that uh, your publication is somehow is uh, more significant than, than the papers that are not much cited. So it's kind of the this is kind of the collective intelligence from the field that uh, try to kind of recognize how good one or how important a, a, a research, research, is, a research paper is. And uh, of course, we, we also can see that sometimes it's not necessarily uh, the paper is being mentioned because it's very good. It can be also it's very bad. So, so we also need to understand that like uh, what are the comment to that paper. So we need to understand uh, for, each, for each paper, we need to understand how it, the reason why it linked to others as well as uh, how we can like uh, uh, really analyze all the content in the paper. So this actually can only be done like uh, large scale through the AI. Uh, with this type of the foundation we build that we are able to help uh, people to understand themselves. So do you know, do you really know yourself? What does your blueprint say about yourself? So right now we have been creating uh, this service that uh, can um, like provides your risk likelihood or like a more than 50 plus diseases. And then you also, uh, so this provides you for each person, like uh, when you look into the system, you are able to see your likelihood on each categories. And then for each categories, what are the uh, possible diseases you have? And uh, you actually can show you like a potential disease. And uh, like uh, in these categories, what are your risk on that? What are your, your risk score? For the non risky uh, alleles on that, and why you match the alleles on that. And if you click on the, for example, the, the, uh, the second one I click, then you actually can show you a short description on what the disease is, and then to the regular user know that. And then you actually can go there to see uh, the reference uh, at the SNP and the, your risk uh, allele and uh, on that. We also provide the information about like uh, if you are from, uh, you actually can enter, you can show that from different kind of races and to see if it's a particular for your race or uh, like uh, if you are from Asia, you know, for Eastern Asian and the uh, the this is go on that, we actually can allow you to change that based on your race. So I think that uh, some interface maybe, yeah, actually is, uh, is on the up right corner. You can select your race. Okay, and to see different kind of risk outcome. Uh, so for each one, we can also help you the educated users can keep digging on what are the key publications in the show evidence on that. So as like as an individual, if I see something serious, I would love to know more. So that's why I would kind of dig into to that, try to understand more on that. So uh, it provides you the detail on that and that you can abstract and the key information. You can even read the paper. So uh, for that, we help each individual uh, understand the, what are the highest risk of this person in which diseases. And the next step would be, okay, so if I have this risk on this, and then what am I today, right? So that's why I want to know uh, as a, a consumer. So next step is about how we can help a consumer, the consumer to understand the what, uh, what is his current uh, disease status. So it's about how we can potentially have a detection platform to understand where you are today. So for example, we work with a company that are providing this uh, uh, multi-press digital PCR platform 
try to like uh, we can customize like uh, uh, for each individual what are the key part key um uh, key variants you should detect on that and then for those uh, variants then we can take optimize the primers and then to let you to detect the particular ones to zoom in on each one and uh, we have been collecting this knowledge graph forming this knowledge graph and potentially for personalized precision medicine so like uh, uh you can see this uh, bio big data that we have been collecting and uh, uh like on the left hand side and then the biomarker uh, identifications uh, with uh, this in-house knowledge graph, more than 200,000 nodes, 1 million edges, and that with a drug, uh, protein, uh, gene, uh, MIR, the relationship on that. And then about the strategy about uh, how we can help on that. For example, subtype A maybe is better for a small molecular drug, subtype B maybe better for the uh, nucleic acid drug, or subtype C maybe better for the biosimilar drug and the central. So well, for this, we actually built this uh, graphene pro, uh, proteogenomics pathway analyzer, and then potentially for each disease, what are your current status? And then you can see that for the pathway, where are you in terms of your, uh, your current uh, gene or uh, phenotype? And then I'll try to show you like, uh, for example, for each mutation you have, uh, you can see it's about uh, what would be the related drugs and how those drugs that uh, can potentially impact you and, the, and the whether you already can have a drug resistance on that. Uh, and then we actually provide the explanation about why uh, some mutation actually can, can have a drug resistance. Okay. And uh, uh, so this model can be also used for like uh, the breast cancer and the other cancers. So in other words, that uh, we are building the, uh, the service that uh, try to help these uh, personalized precision medicine services. And in terms of the, the AI tools help with uh, searching, with uh, detecting suggestion, and uh, even potentially how you can potentially even uh, develop like a bio, uh, biomarker to, uh, to drug is a uh, drugs that are more suitable for, for a person. So this is still an ongoing uh, R&D work that we are developing for these whole services. And uh, uh, in other words, that uh, uh, to summarize our overall work, uh, we have the work on the uh, consumer space and uh, we uh, have this uh, drug development tools, a lot of tools on that, and uh, have uh, continuously uh, for the research work on the uh, virus monitoring, uh, medical understanding, etc. So So uh, we, we uh, have been working on to make these consumer services called development and the research collaborations. So uh, we are looking for the global uh, business and R&D collaborations. And uh, yeah, if you are interested in working on this field together, please contact us in uh, our email here. And uh, yeah, we are keep advancing study R AI technology for the mankind. Uh, special thanks for the TWCC that provide the uh, adult computational resources and uh, for uh, DCB and the Academia Sinica for adult collaborations. So my talks end here. So thank you very much. Thanks. Hello, my name is Philip Tagari and I'm the Vice President of Research for Amgen, the world's largest independent biotechnology company. And today, at the Taiwan Biotechnology Forum, I'm going to talk to you about real-time therapeutics discovery, our attempts to dramatically accelerate the discovery of new and important medicines. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about therapeutics discovery in the last 20 years, and I'll describe a recent attempt to accelerate this process uh, with the discovery of a chemical inhibitor of an oncogenic protein, KRAS. And then I'll talk about some learnings from our pandemic antibody therapeutic program, and finally discuss opportunities and challenges that face the industry as we prepare for pandemics of the future. Despite a lot of progress, drug discovery has, until recently, been a very lengthy process. We start out 
with identifying and validating a drug target and understanding its biology and relationship to the pathophysiology of disease. And that can take over two years. We then have to learn about the uh, molecular features of the target that we've chosen, design molecules that specifically and appropriately engage the target, make those molecules, and then test them in a very large battery of assays in an iterative cycle, which typically takes two to four years, but can take much longer. And then finally, when we've identified a handful of promising molecules, we could advance them as drug candidates through preclinical testing and get them ready for clinical testing. And that can take up to two years. However, in cases of highly compelling biology, we've made attempts to dramatically accelerate this process, as I'll describe with our mutant G12C KRAS inhibitor program. On the left-hand side, you can see that wild-type KRAS is a master regulator of uh, downstream receptor tyrosine kinase signaling, shown on the top left hand of the slide, where signals such as uh, EGF um, can be translated by wild-type KRAS into normal proliferation and differentiation of uh, normal tissues. However, KRAS is quite prone to mutations and shown on the right hand side with a mutation at position 12 of G to C. KRAS under these conditions becomes a receptor tyrosine kinase signaling independent. That is, it becomes constitutively active and dramatically increases its uh, oncogenic signaling, resulting in the formation of tumors. So this makes it an extremely attractive target for solid tumor therapies. But KRAS was described over 30 years ago. And so why has KRAS signaling remained resistant to chemical inhibition for over 30 years? And that's because with the exception of the GTP binding pocket, shown on the bottom left-hand side of the 3D model, of wild type KRAS in its active GTP state, okay, um, there are really very few other places where a drug like molecule can gain a foothold on the protein. It's essentially a smooth sphere. And we can't target the GTP binding pocket because GTP has a very, very high affinity and it's extraordinarily difficult to displace it. So we can regard medicinal chemistry on uh, KRAS is essentially a climber trying desperately to find a foothold or a finger hold on a sheer cliff. RAS provides a case of a compelling drug target, but without a tractable pocket for drug binding. However, a number of years ago, we had a key structural insight when we solved a co-crystal structure of a mutant form of KRAS, G12C, which is involved in many tumors um, with a weak covalent uh, inhibitor. And that crystal structure is shown on the bottom left hand side. And as you can see, the binding of the inhibitor uh, results in the motion of histidine at position 95 and reveals a cryptic larger binding pocket uh, shaded in purple. And you can see in, uh, in yellow, the uh, position that is uh, mutated to the cysteine. And we were able to, from this mo a molecule, develop a, quickly develop a series of inhibitors that were potent and G12 selective uh, uh, molecules. And that's shown on the graph on the right hand side. On the bottom, you can see the potency in a KRAS G12C phosphoerc assay, a signaling assay. And then on the left hand side, you can see the viability after 72 hours of treatment in uh, G12C versus wild type KRAS cells. And as you can see, we have achieved compounds that are potent and G12 selective, G12C selective in the green box compared with the uh, best non-selective molecules. So we've achieved both potency and selectivity. 
Um, and we were able to take this uh, initial starting point and advance that to IND in less than 15 months using a highly accelerated program. So as I mentioned before, you know, typically two to four years to uh, go through this um, iterative process. And we were able to achieve this uh, much, much faster. Shown on the left-hand side, um, this is the uh, exemplar of the lead. We were then able to improve um, its PK properties through early SAR, um, lock the confirmation to confirm metabolic stability, and then optimize pharmaceutical properties with uh, polar modifications. And we achieved this by making over 700 compounds and forming 100 co-crystal structures. So uh, a program that was driven by incredibly efficient structural biology. And we were able in a short period of time to identify two early candidates, one of which is shown uh, in the graph on the bottom left hand side, um, which had uh, extremely good in vivo activity. As you can see, 62% regression in the G12C xenograft uh, tumor model uh, at 100 uh, MPK and extremely well tolerated. We also um, did some uh, interesting experiments where we combined uh, KRAS, G12C and immune checkpoint inhibition. And these uh, resulted in durable cures in an immunocompetent model. So CT26 uh, uh, colon, mouse colon carcinoma was uh, uh, mutated to G12C. And as you can see um, in the top left-hand panel in the blue, blue lines, this is an extremely aggressive uh, tumor. As you can see, uh, almost all of the animals are dead by 35 days and the tumor grows very rapidly. The model is uh, sensitive to KRAS G12C inhibition as shown uh, in red. Um, so uh, you know, significant improvement in survival to over 50 days in many cases with one in 10 showing complete regression. The model is also uh, significantly sensitive to PD-1 inhibition shown in the purple on the bottom left. Uh, again, with one in 10 uh, achieving complete progression. But very excitingly, the combination therapy of G12C inhibition and PD-1 inhibition resulted in nine out of 10 um, uh, complete resolution of the tumor um, and uh, uh, survival uh, greater than 60 days. So a very exciting result that uh, really convinced us to accelerate this program uh, even further into clinical development. So how did we achieve this? And this really was done by significant improvements to what we would call a normal process. Um, so we uh, enhanced our synthetic abilities by having a dedicated synthetic team that was co-located with both purification and uh, an analytical teams. And importantly, we had a highly coordinated supply chain where key building blocks were, were synthesized uh, at our team in China. Um, advanced intermediates were then synthesized by our team in India, and they were transferred to the, uh, the chemistry team in California, typically generating about 25 compounds a week at 100 milligram scale, um, identifying multiple precandidates at the 200 gram scale, and then finally, uh, a series of clinical candidates at three kilogram scale. And throughout, we looked very carefully at the flow scheme of syntheses, crystallography and assays, uh, and shortened the turnaround time consistently, uh, speeding up the SAR. We had very, very clear real-time communication across the full team, and we invested in continuous improvement, uh, making sure that each bottleneck was addressed prior uh, to it becoming uh, an impediment to the program. So by performing these uh, essentially accelerated normal processes, we were able to remove at least two years off the discovery timeline, a very significant achievement. But the pandemic presented us with a unique opportunity to drive acceleration even further with an antibody therapeutic campaign. We knew fairly early on in the pandemic that the majority of patients 
were either asymptomatic or symptomatic but recovered at home. However, about 20% uh, of patients in the early days um, would require admission to the hospital um, and a significant number of those patients would then go on to require uh, intensive care. And so we felt that there was a real opportunity for an antibody therapeutic, um, potentially that could prevent viral entry, although that uh, would require treatment of uh, healthy individuals, um, limit the spread in early infection, um, perhaps affect moderate symptoms, but perhaps the most uh, important therapeutic indication for an antibody therapeutic was patients that demonstrated severe symptoms either at the ho in the hospital or worse in the ICU. Of course, the challenges of this approach was the discovery of antibodies with very high potency. Um, you know, this is an extremely uh, infective virus. Uh, the high viral mutation rate may evade uh, antibody targeting. Um, at that point in the pandemic, there was no, in, no effective therapeutic, and so speed to patients was absolutely vital. Um, and we felt that we needed cost-effective dosing with the convenience of subcutaneous delivery that would enable broadest access. And so um, early in 2020, um, we initiated uh, an antibody campaign. Now, our typical humanized mouse antibody campaign takes about six months once the target has been identified. We spend a fair amount of time um, on a campaign strategy, um, designing uh, immunogens and uh, DNA immunization reagents. Um, we immunize uh, our humanized uh, mouse that generates a repertoire of fully human antibodies. Those are subjected to uh, extensive screening for selectivity um, potency and uh, in silico properties. And then we scale up uh, a number of those to um, early leads prior to transfer into protein engineering, uh, cell line development, uh, manufacturability, uh, and ultimately candidate nomination. Um, but we re-engineered this process very dramatically. Um, first, as there was very little known um, about potential immunogens, we used our modeling protein and cryo-EM expertise to very rapidly engineer critical reagents and reagents that were optimized to present uh, in native conformations, particularly um, for binding uh, and neutralization assays. And so you can see um, the structure of the spike protein on the left-hand side. Um, with S1 containing uh, the receptor binding domain, and then S2 being the stalk uh, and fusion domains. And you can see on the right-hand side some very early cryo-electron micrographs um, that we were able to achieve, which very quickly showed us um, how to design uh, proteins that had uh, absolutely um, the best conformation and gave us the best chance of identifying highly potent, highly selective neutralizing antibodies. And we completely re-engineered um, our typical hybridoma process. Uh, and by doing so, we're able to complete lead identification uh, in fewer than three months. And this was a, from a completely cold start. We had never worked uh, upon this target before. So instead of starting out with immunization and hybridoma generation, we of course had the uh, opportunity to start from uh, infected patients. Patients were selected for highest IgG uh, antiviral titer. Um, their blood uh, was collected and flown uh, to our um, antibody discovery team in Burnaby in British Columbia. Um, we very rapidly were able to use our cryo-EM qualified um, reagents to sort on uh, S1 and S2 specific memory B cells. We uh, performed uh, in vitro B cell culture um, with antibody secretion uh, using supernatants in high throughput binding um, uh, ACE2 blocking uh, and affinity and epitope mapping um, assays. Um, recovered all of the uh, genes from uh, the hypervariable uh, coding, hypervariable region coding genes 
uh, from the best looking um, clones, um, sequenced, uh, put into expression vectors and expressed in small scale. Um, did a very wide uh, uh, set of mechanism of action assays, including viral spreading, viral uh, egress, um, and uh, some uh, cocktail combinations. Um, and then went into live virus neutralization assays um, prior to uh, identifying candidates for um, in vivo and then manufacturability and scale up. And so, as I said, you know, this is dramatically accelerated from a completely standing start to uh, advanced leads in less than three months. And we felt we were at a point where uh, clinical manufacturing and trial initiation um, would be done uh, in another three months. However, uh, and we also um, were encouraged that our antibodies were validated by um, wild type uh, strain uh, live virus assays using the then Washington strain. Um, just shown briefly on this slide where we uh, co-incubated our leads um, with uh, uh, infectious particles, um, incubated those um, in vero cells and then performed um, early spot assays to uh, 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 understand the ability of the virus to infect the cells through a focus forming assay. And as you can see below, um, you know, this is a, a, a very effective assay. You can see in the absence of antibody um, on the bottom uh, row, on the left six hand columns, um, you know, extreme uh, early high focus forming activity compared to uh, the control um, on the bottom three um, uh, uh, columns on the right hand side. And then uh, in the S1 binder, uh, very nice dose dependent um, inhibition of focus forming. So uh, our whole process was validated um, quite effectively and we were uh, comfortable that we had uh, identified very uh, potent neutralizing uh, antibodies. Um, but despite that dramatic acceleration, uh, antibody discovery was clearly slower than mRNA vaccine development. And you can see uh, in the large um, box, you know, typically um, that's a decade plus long uh, process. But, um, you know, our colleagues at uh, Pfizer, BioNext and Moderna were able to uh, compress the entire uh, process, not just the um, discovery of the, um, of the vaccine, but also uh, its manufacturing and its clinical assessment uh, into dramatically short periods of time, less than a year. And so this really uh, overtook uh, almost all of the uh, antibody therapeutics that were in development, uh, including our own, and has led to, um, you know, dramatic levels of, uh, of vaccination uh, in, in many populations. So what did we learn from our KRAS G12C and our pandemic program? Well, we learned, uh, importantly, that structural biology is hugely empowering for both program design as well as molecule design, uh, both co-crystallography for a G12C inhibitor as well as cryo-EM for um, reagent design um, for neutralizing antibodies. Um, we also realized that, you know, uh, logistics are as important for drug discovery as they are uh, for manufacturing supply chain. So the ability to move reagents, to move proteins, uh, to move assays around um, as the programs um, evolve uh, was incredibly important to both projects. And then finally, um, you know, taking an existing discovery capability, uh, such as the uh, discovery of uh, human monoclonal antibodies from a uh, humanized mouse and re-engineering it to use uh, a primary B cell process was an incredibly effective accelerator. And so, uh, you know, having existing capability and re-engineering um, is a very effective way um, of accelerating. And so how does this um, allow us to prepare um, for a therapeutic response to a potential new pandemic? So one way, um, you know, to approach this is to think about large scale structural biology um, on viral proteomes. So I've shown you um, the ability to very rapidly 
uh, generate a cryo -M, uh, information um, around, you know, the stalk protein. And then, you know, recent uh, dramatic advances in computational prediction suggests that, you know, it would not be too much of an effort to fully understand, um, you know, the structural biology of the most um, uh, uh, likely infectious viral proteomes. And then uh, potentially use that information for the industrialized generation of antibody repertoires, um, particularly against uh, molecules that would be um, predicted to be um, on the surface of viral particles, the so-called, um, you know, surface arm. This would then allow, uh, you know, very rapid um, uh, trans translation of those repertoires uh, into potentially neutralizing antibodies as new strains or new viruses uh, became either epidemic or pandemic. And then finally, we've seen the power um, of mRNA vaccines and potentially uh, mRNA therapeutics. Um, and so, you know, overcoming the uh, challenges of building, you know, large factories and, uh, you know, large supply chains to uh, distribute mRNA vaccines and to think about distributed and self-contained, um, you know, discovery and manufacture um, of such molecules, the so-called kind of GMP in a box strategy. And so to summarize, um, until recently, you know, discovery of a new therapeutic uh, prior to entry in the clinic could take up to 10 years, often uh, longer than that. Uh, and that would leave many patients without appropriate treatments. But we were able to significantly accelerate the discovery of a KRAS G12C a potent and selective inhibitor by really taking existing processes um, and, and <clears throat> modifying them to the absolute limit of their performance. But that would clearly not be enough as a response for a pandemic. Um, and that urgent response drove the re-engineering of our antibody discovery uh, platform, uh, allowing very, very rapid process. And emerging technologies um, such as distributed mRNA manufacturing and mRNA vaccines promise, in fact, an even faster therapeutic response to any new viral threat. And so with that, um, I thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Grady and I'm the Senior Vice President for Business Development Operations in AstraZeneca, based here in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. It's my very great pleasure to have been invited by Professor Han Chung to be a keynote speaker at the 2021 Taiwan Biotech Forum under the title, Innovation and Partnerships in a Post-COVID Era. This morning, I intend to cover four topics. Firstly, to mention a few fast facts about AstraZeneca generally. Secondly, to talk a little bit about how AstraZeneca responded as a company in the fight against the COVID-19 virus. Thirdly, to share some observations on, on how partnering played out during the pandemic, and finally, highlighting some of the areas where innovation generally and partnering in particular might be a little different in the post-COVID era. So first to start with some AstraZeneca fast facts. AstraZeneca is a global biopharmaceutical company with over 70,000 employees in over 100 countries around the world. We have 26 manufacturing sites in 16 countries. Our 2020 revenues were nearly $27 billion. And in 2020, we invested nearly $6 billion in research and de development, mostly, but not exclusively, at our three research and development strategic centers here in Cambridge in the UK, in Gothenburg in Sweden, and at Gaithersburg 
in Maryland, in the greater Washington area, close to the NIH. Partnering is a critical component of our strategy. We have entered into over 120 strategically important transactions in the last three years alone. We have more than 800 active collaborations worldwide, helping us to access the best science, stimulate innovation, and accelerate the delivery of new medicines for unmet medical need. We have a strong and growing business in Taiwan under the inspiring leadership of Justin Chin and his team. AstraZeneca Taiwan had a particularly strong growth in cardiovascular portfolio in quarter one, 2021, and has risen strongly to be now the third oncology company in Taiwan. And the AZ Taiwan team are amongst the most active in terms of supporting the life science ecosystem there and amongst the very best in AstraZeneca globally. So maybe now I could turn to talk a little bit about how AstraZeneca responded to the emergence of the pandemic. Like all companies and organizations, our first priority was to secure the safety and well being of our employees. And secondly, as a global pharmaceutical company, as far as humanly possible, to secure the continuation of delivery of our medicines to our patients, including those patients enrolled in our clinical trials around the world. At the start of the pandemic, we donated 9 million masks to support healthcare workers around the world. And in the UK, we worked with GlaxoSmithKline and the University of Cambridge to rapidly establish a COVID-19 testing center here in Cambridge to significantly expand the, the COVID testing capacity of the United Kingdom. We quickly started to investigate our existing medicines in our portfolio that could potentially be repurposed for the prevention or treatment of COVID-19. And from our pre-existing collaboration with Vanderbilt University, we identified a combination of long acting antibodies, which bind to the virus spike protein. And this followed a screen of over 1500 monoclonal antibodies to find what we believe would be the best neutralizer to the COVID-19 virus. This combination, AZ7442, entered phase three clinical trials for both the prevention and treatment of COVID and data is expected later this year. And finally, perhaps best known, is that we entered into a collaboration with the University of Oxford to help develop and distribute the vaccine originally developed by Oxford and Vacitech, AZD1222, Vaxavira, which has become known around the world as the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. We are immensely proud of the fact that the vaccine will be, a made, be made available on a not-for-profit basis during the period of the pandemic and in perpetuity in low and middle income countries. In quarter one of this year, over 200 million doses of the vaccine were made available globally and over 100 countries have now been supplied through COVAX, saving many lives in so doing. Thinking about partnering during the pandemic, my impression was that business development professionals around the world adapted quickly and effectively to the new conditions. Conversations continued and deals got done. I think this was because business development teams are used to working with dispersed project teams. So working remotely 
and this did not present too much of a problem. If anything, access to senior stakeholders was easier than normal as our senior executive decision makers themselves stopped traveling and were much more readily available. If anything, things speeded up. I also believe the prior investments we had all made in forming strong personal and organizational relationships paid huge dividends during the pandemic. It was a lot, lot easier to negotiate effectively and solve problems with someone that you knew well and trusted. AstraZeneca negotiated the $6 billion co-commercialization, co-develop, risk share, profit share collaboration covering DS1062, Daiichi Sankyo's antibody drug conjugate pipeline product without ever having any face-to-face -face meet meetings during the conduct of that transaction and negotiation. And in December of last year, AstraZeneca announced the proposed acquisition of Alexion for $39 billion with the latter stages of the deal negotiations also being concluded by our colleagues completely remotely. Closing of the Alexion transaction is expected in quarter three, 2021, subject to regulatory clearances. Turning now to how innovation generally and partnering in particular is likely to be different in a post-COVID era, it, it's indisputable that COVID-19 has been a catalyst to change pharmaceutical research and development activities and traditional clinical trial delivery specifically hugely. There is no doubt that at a macro level, large pharma have and will continue to direct renewed research efforts towards infectious diseases. In my role as business development head in AstraZeneca, I have received literally hundreds of approaches from companies developing technologies and seeking partnerships in infectious disease, developing novel therapies and vaccines. The pandemic has also highlighted the critical importance of partnerships in addressing the world's healthcare challenges. Everything that AstraZeneca has done to fight the virus has been done through partnerships. Whether it's developing the vaccine with Oxford University, estab establishing the testing center with Cambridge University and GSK, or progressing the long acting antibody, which originated from our partnership with Vanderbilt University. The pandemic has also had the effect of accelerating the adoption and utilization of digital tools, techniques, and approaches across research and development, development activities, particularly in the conduct of clinical trials. In AstraZeneca's case, our digital clinical innovation strategy rollout was well underway, but undoubtedly has been significantly accelerated over the last 18 months. In the post-pandemic era, we envisage that the majority of clinical trials will encompass a digital component. In the very near future, the conduct of clinical trials will increasingly involve drug delivery to patients at home, virtual patient monitoring visits, and remote monitoring generally, with patients themselves reporting their outcomes simplifying the clinical trial procedures and making them less burdensome for patients, enabling earlier data collection and the emergence of new insights. AstraZeneca has conducted its first fully virtual clinical trial 
of one of our respiratory medicines involving over 2,000 patients, which we estimate saved six months or a 20% acceleration of the timetable and was conducted at an overall 30% lower cost. In another trial, we estimate that the use of artificial intelligence enables data analysis to be completed in four minutes that would take four months of manual adjudication at more than 50% lower cost. Over the next five years, across our portfolio, we've identified the potential to achieve a 30% cycle time improvement and 20% lower cost saving from the deployment and acceleration of these new approaches. So in closing and summary, I would leave you with the reflections that the pandemic has brought about transformation in science. We've never seen as much science delivered so quickly that we're seeing today, and this will only speed up even further. As an industry and as a company, we cannot and will not go back to the way things were. The pandemic has been a call to action and we in AstraZeneca are looking forward to working with our partners to deliver on the opportunities that lie ahead. That brings me to the end of the short presentation this morning. Thank you for your time and attention today. Good luck with the program. I hope you have a successful event and I look forward to seeing you in person in the very near future. In the meantime, thank you again and stay safe. The numbers are startling. Not millions, but billions of people around the world are trying to balance living their lives with the limits of living with chronic diseases. Some of the biggest healthcare challenges facing humankind. For all of these people, we want to transform healthcare. We are uncovering and targeting the drivers of disease, accelerating diagnosis and treatments, empowered by digital technologies, data and AI. Our ambition, to stop the progress of these often degenerative, debilitating and life-threatening conditions, achieve remission and one day cure them. Changing the course of medical practice, transforming treatment and getting it to all those billions of people living with the most common chronic diseases so they can live life without limits. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Liu from National Chenggong University and the hospital. It is my honor to present and share some of our working output from our scientific research center for pandemic event since last year. We actually have a very special name of our quarantine house. That is Cure, Q-U-R-E, named after the quarantine unit for emergency. So when we trace back to our history, we all now agree that the pandemic event will not be absolutely the last time for everyone here. We had previous experience for the pandemic event from Spanish flu. At that time, 1980 to 1990, our Taiwanese were infected by 170,000 people and 20,000 people were eventually dead. This time, however, as we all understand that the second wave hit caused a more than 3,000 infected person right now, and they have an increased mortality and morbidity rate with all our efforts to prevent and the quarantine process. So we might need high technology and AI assisted modern technology to help our medical teams to effectively and efficiently pick out the one who is very dangerous. 
For the purpose, we designed this QWERTY system by combination multiple professional considerations. They include architectural professionals, medical professionals, biohazard management, fluid dynamic professionals, and also material science experts input. We had four special points to mention for this cure system. The first one, we did this design module mobile emergency hospital, taking system consider consideration, including indoor airflow and air conditioning design, water supply, drainage, and the electrical equipment system design, etc. The second, we perform CFD computational fluid dynamics simulation. That is to reproduce the aerial propagation behavior produced by the patient's cough to explore the ventilation efficiency of various air conditioning air outlets, thus simulation the condition in the hospital. Furthermore, we use photodynamic methylation blue median as a new disinfection tool for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which was compared to the traditional disinfection alcohol and ultraviolet radiation disinfection. Finally, it proved that it's very efficient. Finally, to ensure the disability of virus in our cure system, we also establish environmental air quality indicators, state worker environmental satisfaction feedback questionnaires, and the body surface microbial inspections. They can protect our staff in the cure system to be very safe, and the patient in the cure system will also be protected. So now I will introduce the QR2 is an update module quarantine unit for emergency. QR2 was different from the QR1 because we need some mobile assistant delivery in the pandemic condition. As shown in our slide, we can figure out that our field design will be based on a legal building block. And the size and the numbers can be built up depending on the demand and the size designed by the pandemic condition. For example, if we're looking into here, this is a situation similar to the emergency, was very severe, an outbreak happened near the airport, like a community one. And then we need to put many clinical units and the testing and also lab units together, which will become a very big size and be very great, like a community one, for example, like this one. But on the other hand, sometimes we only need a very small lab unit like this one. The lab unit need will be only limited to a smaller size. So uh, with various size needed, the size is very flexible and very convenient to transport. The QO2 system was composed by several components together. For example, uh, they have a test, test lab, they also have X-ray lab, and also they have a component for the air conditioning. To facilitate the end of our cure system with advanced feasibility and transportable, we applied another core concept for our team to build up these QO2 mobile stations we have four special points to be mentioned. The first one, it is very mobile. The second, it is a very small modular unit and very easy to carry on. The third one, it is easy to disassemble and assemble for only a few days. The fourth, it is eco-friendly and recycling. So we can put this one into a trunk and we can transport to somewhere that is needed for emergency purpose. So I think this is a very uh, smart invention for the pandemic condition. So we have a very special uh, figure for the MCOV tanner. MCOV tanner uh, was named after the mobile, M means mobile, 
COV is COV19, and the tenor is the container of this unit. So NCOV tenor is the name of the QR2. It is one of the QR2 module quarantine unit here. And the background color is the color of National Chenggong University. So I, I will introduce the NCOV tenor a little bit. It is a mobile COV container. And what's design concept is uh, very flexible and it is a micro positive pressure bubble and operated through its three airtight window counter units that can be closed to create a physical barrier coupled with motorized fans or air condition and sterilized equipment. For this purpose, our staff can make their work very comfortably and very easily without physical or mental pressure in this room. So the NCOV channel, we have uh, very easy to use. They have five very important compartments for this quarantine module. The first one, is we have a uh, we have a sample, sampling window with separate glasses. So it's a quarantine module is very easy and safe. The second, we have chest x-ray examination room inside. So they can carry out without any difficulty. The third one, the photodynamicer will faster and safely sterilize process. That is, uh, has been tested in our uh, study teams. They can uh, sterilize the virus uh, very easily and safely. The fourth one, we designed the rain and the sun protection. It is a roof uh, for patient and subject who come to our room for test or for examination. And finally, it is a air conditioning room embedded. This is a back wall of the, the room. This is a front wall of the room. So in, in summary, is a very modern design for um, sterilization and the checking process. Uh, in the room, we also use several innovative uh, systems. So one of our design smart clinical assistant system was embedded in the computer and also in our system for X-ray interpretation. It was called a smart medical consultation system. They support uh, seven to 13 languages. The patient, they can self fill in their medical records such as travel history, the work history, the content history, and group history. They can reduce the risk of cross infection between patient and also the staffs. They can raise in the efficacy for inspections. Also, we add uh, COVID checks for COVID-19 pneumonia interpretation. It is a quickly recognized pulmonary infiltration from the X-ray and the relief some of the personnel's pressure to making clinical decisions. We have very high sensitivity and specificity for the AI interpretation. And finally, we open this to the Nationwide Medical Institute to apply for use. So not only NCKU can use that, all the Taiwan uh, hospital, they can use this system very easily. And our system quickly recognize the pulmonary infiltration, shortening the process for the quarantine for 2.5 hours to just 13 minutes is very efficient. We also have other innovative development for prevention of nosocomia outbreak. For example, we have very good four-phase nebulization mask. This one, we have a, a high efficiency particle air, that is a HEPA filter on the top of the mask. It was approved by the Taiwan's patent and is applying for European and American patents as well. This production has been published in a very good journal uh, from our experience. We also collaborate with IoT for pandemic control. We have a remote physical signals and indoor tracking by a watch. A watch, they can detect their body temperature and their um, tracing track for all the patients and all the staffs 
in a hospital or in a house. This remote physical signs and the indoor tracking, they can also done with a high fever one take detection rate. The sensitivity and the specificity were 95% and 81% respectively, which is quite useful for indoor pandemic spread condition right now. So now I would like to summary of our achievement. The first one, we have a QR building, which was available freely download online for the whole world people to use. The QR2 M COVID tenor, it is mobile, is flexible, it is comfortable and multi-task embedded all in one. We have smart clinical assistant system. It is a decision-making process embedded and AI assistant pneumonia interpretation, which made our process very quickly and short by many times. Also, we have innovative IoT development. We have full-face nebulized mask they can protect from aerosol spreading for the virus. And also we have remote physical signals and indoor tracking, which will be very useful in a pandemic condition, especially as right now. So the power of knowledge is to constantly discover new technological innovations with new knowledge to carry every unnatural challenge. With the help from Taiwan Ministry of Science and Technology, Taiwan Most, we NCKU and the NCKU Hospital keep our faith for the casting the light of knowledge, which is also the core value of NCKU now and forever. I will thank you for your listening. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Wen Chen Chang at National Yangming Jiao Tong University School of Law. It's my honor and privilege to discuss with you on this important topic, COVID-19 and human rights, illustrating Taiwan's experience. Some of you might be wondering, why talking about pandemic and human rights? Are there any relationship? The answer is definitely yes. We know that pandemics take away people's life and substantially affect their health. Both right to life and right to health are core concerns of human rights. In order to protect people's right to life and right to health, it is a paramount duty of the government to effectively control the pandemic. At the same time, measures to control the pandemic such as quarantine, contact tracing, shelter in place, may impose restrictions on other core human rights, such as personal freedom, right to movement, right to travel, privacy right. In addition, when pandemic control measures take into consideration human rights concerns, they may have better compliance and greater effectiveness. Hence, they are definitely a close relationship between pandemic control and human rights. In the following, I shall discuss first COVID-19 pandemic control and international human rights law. Then I will use three examples to illustrate how Taiwan has tried to balance pandemic control and human rights, including quarantine and personal freedom, technology and privacy, migrant workers. Finally, I will discuss some of the unresolved issues with conclusion. First, COVID-19 and international human rights. Taiwan has been barred from participating in the United Nations and related international organizations, including World Health Organization. And yet, in the last 10 years, Taiwan has voluntarily and unilaterally acceded to some of the core international human rights conventions. These include International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, ICESCR, Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, 
Convention on the Rights of the Child, CRC, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, CRED, third. All of these conventions are now part of Taiwanese law. The two covenants and the rights enshrined in the two covenants are heavily concerned with human rights protections even during a health emergency. The Human Rights Committee has emphasized that no derogation from right to life, from the prohibition against torture, from the protection of freedom of thought, conscience, and religion may be made. Similarly, the CEDA Committee issued a guidance note last year when the pandemic was at its peak, addressing the pandemic's disproportionate impacts on women's health, urging all the government to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, particularly with stay-home orders. Likewise, the Committee on the Rights of the Child also issued a statement concerning COVID-19, asking all the government must maintain basic service for children, and they must protect children whose vulnerability is further increased by the exceptional circumstances. Similar to children, persons with disabilities are also a vulnerable group. A policy brief was issued last year, asking all the government to try to improve health outcome for persons with disabilities, and they must ensure accessibility of information, facility, service, and program in COVID-19 response and recovery. More importantly, government must ensure distance learning is accessible to and inclusive of students with disabilities. One other convention that is worth noting is Convention Against Torture, CAT. Although Taiwan is not a state party to CAT, last year, Taiwan's government is trying to implement CAT Convention in the domestic legal system. An Implementation Act draft is currently pending the review in the legislature. CAT Convention and the committee has also issued concerns with the detention facilities, immigration detentions to all government. They ask all government to conduct assessments to identify those individuals most at risk within the detained population. They also ask the government during the pandemic to try to reduce population in prison, in immigration center, in all other refugee camps. Also, the International Convention on the Protection of Rights of Migrant Workers is worthy noting here. A guidance note was also issued last year to urge all the government to protect the human rights of migrants and their families, irrespective of their migration status. The government must try to integrate migrant workers into national COVID-19 prevention and response plan and policies, and must guarantee access to social service for migrants and their families. Again, Taiwan is not party to migrant convention. And yet, last year, Taiwan's new Human Rights Commission has proposed a plan to incorporate these rights into Taiwan's domestic legal regime. In my second part of presentation, I would illustrate three key examples in which Taiwan's government has tried to strike a balance between pandemic control and human rights. First is the quarantine and the restrictions to personal freedom and freedom of movement. Already in the last time, the SARS outbreak in 2003, whether or not 
quarantine orders are met with constitutional provision, Article 8, protection of personal freedom, and the due process and the proportional principle enshrined in that article was at a question before constitutional court. Our constitutional court has issued an interpretation number 690, holding that quarantine orders do not violate Article 8, protecting personal freedom and due process, as well as principle of proportionality enshrined in the Constitution. At the same time, the Constitutional Court has emphasized that in order to keep the length of quarantine period reasonable and not excessive, the law must prescribe a reasonable maximum time for compulsory quarantine. More importantly, the court also demand that prompt remedies and adequate compensation regime must be in place. These demands by the Constitutional Court later on were written into the law. Not only the rights of personal freedom is guaranteed in the Constitution and implemented through the previous constitutional interpretation. Those rights are also extended to foreigners through interpretation number 708. In this interpretation, our constitutional court has held that not extending habeas corpus protection to foreigners violates Article 8, guaranteeing personal freedom. As a result of these two interpretations, a balance between personal freedom and pandemic control has struck. During this pandemic, quite a few judicial cases involving COVID-19 related quarantine orders and detentions were brought to the court. The government has also launched a compensation regime for people affected by quarantine orders, not only for nationals. Foreigners may also, under conditions stipulated in law, receive some of the benefits. My second example is with technology and privacy. Privacy is not only guaranteed in Taiwan's constitution as well as the constitutional interpretation. But more importantly, it has been firmly written into CDC Act. Article 10 of CDC Act has stated that medical record and medical history shall not be disclosed. More importantly, the Special Act for Prevention COVID-19 we passed last year also included a provision that personal data specified in that law shall be processed in accordance with related provisions and regulations for personal data protection, and relevant data must be destroyed after the end of pandemic. Taiwan has been famous in terms of using quite technological savvy apps such as contact tracing app or electronic fence for enforcement of quarantine orders. But these apps had to be taken into consideration the protection of privacy. In order to ensure personal data protection, public or private entities where personal data is collected must designate a person in charge of keeping a record of and maintaining personal data collected. Such data can be retained only for 28 days, 4 weeks, and should be deleted after that specific period of time. Those technological savvy approaches to fight pandemic, those apps for social distancing, for regulation of these apps, functions through calculating distance via 
Bluetooth signals without disclosing personal information, and any data information transmitted or stored according to the law previously described will have to be dealt with according to law and be destroyed after the pandemic. My last example concerning the rights of migrant workers. In Taiwan, migrant workers are covered by Taiwan's national health insurance with universal, universal coverage. During this pandemic, in the government website, essential information are circulated and provided in several foreign languages, including English, Japanese, Thai, Indonesian, and Vietnamese. Linear enforcement for undocumented migrant workers has been in place. For example, last year, in March, the National Immigration Agency launched a temporary program under which overstaying foreigners could receive lesser punishment. This year, when we face a surge of the COVID cases, the Taipei city government has announced that undocumented migrant workers can receive medical treatments and take COVID-19 tests without charge, and they need not worry about any potential legal actions against their undocumented status. These measures have facilitated undocumented migrant workers and their protection of their rights during the pandemic. There are still some of the unresolved issues with the approach to human rights and pandemic control. In my view, there are three major issues. First, concerns boosting medical capacity. Although the government has managed to buy affordable quarantine facilities with high level of hygiene standards, the legislation relating to enhancing quarantine capacity during medical search is still lacking. Second, promoting solidarity in pandemic. Although the competent authorities have promised to be lenient with undocumented migrant workers, the legislation relating to the easing of such enforcement action against them is still not firmly written into law. And this might make undocumented migrant workers hesitant to comply with pandemic control measures. Last but not the least concerns processing of personal data. Although the government has stressed that all collected personal data will only be retained for 28 days and most for weeks. The legislation relating to an independent agency overseeing the government's processing of personal data is still not yet available. This somehow undermines individual and society's trust with the government's usage of these personal data. In my conclusion, I would say Taiwan's success in combating COVID-19 pandemic is not only through technology, but really through a human rights center model, which deserves greater detention. This model includes three aspects. First, transparency. Taiwan's daily press conference has contributed to an active dialogue between the government and the stakeholders. Second, democracy and rule of law. Taiwan's vibrant civil society and local communities have been a crucial counterbalance to any misuse or abuse of government powers 
in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Last but not the least is also my point of today's presentation is human rights and civil liberties. Despite Taiwan's exclusion from the international community, Taiwan's human rights standards are in line with international norms and have facilitated rather than impeded in controlling the ongoing pandemic. These are my short presentations. I thank you for your attention and any comments and questions are welcome.